Good afternoon, everyone. This is Pat Kelleher of the Home Care Alliance of Mass, and I'm sitting here with Megan Fournier, our Director of Education. Welcome to today's Hospice Regulatory Update. Um, today, our speaker is well-known hospice expert, Kim Skian. Um, and many of you may know Kim Skian as a consultant with Simeon Consultants, where she is a frequent speaker at conferences, a consultant to organizations, an overall expert on hospice issues. Um, some of you may or may not know she's also under contract to the Home Care Alliance for this fiscal year in response to our board strategic initiative, which was to bring some hospice expertise to the members in response to requests we had relative to what I understand is a multitude of new hospice regulatory changes in process or soon to be in process. Um, as a consultant with the Home Care Alliance, Kim has reconstituted our hospice committee and she's working on several other hospice initiatives besides these regulations that you'll soon hear more about. She will be helping us to provide feedback to CMS on this proposed rule, so she will be offering um, her email address for you to provide comments directly to her, or as always directly to me or Colleen Bayat at the Home Care Alliance. Uh, all of the lines right now are on mute only, so as not to have uh, background noise, but you can, as Kim speaks, feel free to type in questions or comments right into the chat box, um, and if she's able to, she address them on this call. Again, I thank you for being on the call, and I'll turn the program over to Kim. Thank you, Pat, and, uh, and thank you, Megan, and welcome, everybody. I appreciate you taking the time today to join today's webinar. And I'm privileged to be working directly with the Home Care Alliance of Mass, of Mass team to really provide support to the members who are hospice providers. As Pat said, our goal is to provide you as hospice leaders in our state an update of key ind industry and regulatory issues facing hospices today. The handouts that were sent out earlier today have been slightly edited, so what you'll see on your screen may be a little bit different than the handouts if you've printed them out. Uh, but there are no changes in the number of slides. Megan will be sending the updated handouts with the link to the recording once this webinar is finished. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me myself or Megan. So today, uh, we're, I'm going to be describing the, brief, the current industry regulatory and reimbursement issues facing the hospice industry, provide an overview and status update of the CMS 2018 Hospice Wage Index and Payment Rate Update, and the Hospice Quality Reporting uh, Proposed Rule. Identify strategies briefly to assist providers in preparation and implementation of hospice public reporting requirements based on CMS guidance. We're going to start with just a review of the hospice landscape, where we are today. It's not surprising that the hospice industry is facing increasing scrutiny and regulatory changes. With the national growth in volume and expenditures in hospice over the last several years, CMS and the federal government are taking a closer look at hospices. In addition, the healthcare industry as a whole, the landscape is changing in terms of reimbursement and alignment with providers and payers. All of these present challenges and opportunities for hospice providers. Some of the areas where we see an increased focus on hospice include MedPAC reports, state and federal payment audits, compliance program issues and, and uh, areas of concern, PEPPER reports, Medicare Part D expenditures, as well as ongoing uh, issues with survey and survey readiness. And we'll talk further about these issues during the presentation. The changing hospice landscape is part of the overall healthcare landscape with its significant shifts in how care is provided and paid for across settings. The Affordable Care Act has brought many changes, and it remains to be seen if there will be an impact to the ACA under the new administration that impacts hospice providers as well. Some of the industry changes that we see that impact hospices include the following. Certainly the implementation of ACOs and integration of hospital systems um, and affiliations with physician groups, payers, and other healthcare system partners, collaboration among post-acute players, the growth of palliative care and advanced care planning, implementation of integrated health care, quality, and yes, I have it three times, quality, 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 because as we know, living in a, a value-based purchasing environment, 
We are uh, heading down the road of being paid for quality. Uh, Value-based purchasing is not in place yet in hospice, but um, you can anticipate that sometime in the future it, we will be also facing it as well. And of course, with all of the, change, the regulatory changes and reimbursement changes in the healthcare industry as a whole, there continues to be uh, a, an, an, a percentage of consolidations and mergers, which may continue again into 2018 and then forward. So the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee, or MedPAC, has been recommending hospice payment reform since 2009. MedPAC has, uh, cites continu continuing concerns, including the increasing number of providers with a 7% increase in for-profits, suggesting access to capital is not a problem. It's worth noting, however, that the aggregate rate of marginal profit, that's the rate which Medicare payments exceed providers' marginal costs, was actually 11% in 2014 and is projected to be 7.7% .7 in 2017. But because of the continued, uh, the, the continued rate of marginal profit, earlier this year, Med MedPAC recommended no update to payment rates in 2018. Well, CMS is not, is not listening to that in terms of um, payment rates for the proposed rule, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But it, it does continue to be an issue of reimbursement ongoing, um, both hospice, uh, home health, and other settings as well. The increasing in hospice, uh, the number of hospices and increases in very long stays also results in more hospices exceeding the cap. And there's also been a growth in, in use of hospice by beneficiaries with non-cancer diagnoses, resulting in the fact that, um, that non-cancer diagnoses is actually the, the highest percentage of, of beneficiaries uh, that receive hospice services. In January of 2016 was the implementation of the first changes to hospice payments since 1983, with the implementation of the, the new rates that, that we began to uh, witness with a two-tiered rate as well as the service intensity add-on. MedPAC used these 2016 payment reforms as modest with the possibility of additional reform measures in, in the future. So we started to see an increase in uh, interest in quality measures and reporting. As we know, we'll, I'll be addressing that further uh, in, in a few slides. There, currently is not publicly reported information, but all of that is going to change as of late summer of 2017. Some of the other, some of the other recommendations that MedPAC is continuing to monitor or areas are continuing to monitor include the, the recommendation that hospice be included in Medicare Advantage benefit packages. As, at this point, MedPAC will continue to monitor general trends and monitor the impact of hospice payment reform changes that have recently been implemented, and also include expanded diagnosis reporting, length of stay, large discharge patterns, and relationship with provision of service, and of course, the, um, the, the agencies that exceed the cap. Non-hospice spending uh, in Medicare Parts A, B, and D, live discharges at day 61, readmissions after a 60-day gap, visits or lack thereof uh, in those last days of life, and pre-hospice spending are also areas that MedPAC is going to continue to monitor. And of course, on the horizon, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations have had developed some of the initiatives, such as the Medicare Choice Model. We'll have to see where these initiatives go with the new administration. Value-based purchasing, as we know, is here for home health, and again, wouldn't be at all surprised to see its introduction into hospice in the not-too-distant future. The cost of quality, as a reminder, we have a 2% reduction in the market basket if you're not participating in hospice quality reporting. And again, hospice re uh, public reporting is starting later this summer, which we're going to talk more in detail. Other highlights of the 2017 MedPAC report include these benchmarks from 2015 data. Now, it's interesting that this is 2015 data from the MedPAC report, but yet you're going to see some additional data that has come through on the 2018 proposed rule um, with some slight, and 2016 data that also has some slight variation. 
In 2015, MedPAC reports more than 1.3 million Medicare beneficiaries, including for nearly 49% of decedents, received hospice services from about 4,200 providers nationwide. Medicare hospice expenditures totaled approximately $15.9 billion. In 2015, hospice use increased across all demographic and beneficiary groups examined, and the rates continued to be lower, however, for racial and ethnic minorities. The average length of stay declined slightly. Um, as we can see, in 2014, it was 88.2 days, and then in 2015, it has decreased slightly to 86.7 days and the median length of stay has remained at 17 days. Shifting gears, we're now going to talk briefly about the 2018 proposed rule. It was published May 3rd of 2000, uh, sorry, May 3rd of 2017, I don't know why that's the 16, I apologize, in the Federal Register. And this is the link here for the, uh, for the, 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 proposed, the proposed rule. The comments are due to CMS by uh, June 26, 2017. And the association will be drafting comments and seeking provider inputs, as Pat had mentioned. So hospice providers are encouraged to submit comments to me at uh, kski and at syncomecare.org or, or my Simeon uh, email address, with it, which is at the end of this email as well. You can also submit comments to Pat or Colleen to the, uh, to the uh, alliance. And we will make sure that we compile those comments and feedback and create uh, comments that will be submitted prior to the deadline. So I'll, I'll review some of the proposed highlights. Uh, from the financial standpoint, there is an update to the payment rates, 1% 1, 1 for 2018 only. So even though MedPAC had recommended no increase, there was an up, update, uh, an up, or recommended update to the payment rates for uh, 1%. Now, the reason for this is because this is actually an across-the-board increase for uh, all health settings as part of the Medicare Access and SHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. So MACRA requires that all health all healthcare settings uh, have receive a one percent increase for one year only. In future years, the hospice market basket will increase will revert back to the market basket formula unless congressional action changes that process or that rate. Sequestration continues at minus 2%, and you continue to have, as I said before, a 2% reduction in your market basket rate if quality reporting is not, is not submitted. The new OMB CBSAs were fully implemented in 2017, and the cap year has been aligned with the federal fiscal year of 10-1 to 9-30. So this is just a brief overview of the overall, the national payment rates, uh, um, both for 2017 and what the proposed payment rates are for 2018. When looking at the hospice wage index for Massachusetts, it's clear that there are overall reductions in the rates for the state as a whole, but with variations as noted here. We'll review the hospice wage index calculations on the next slide, and this, available, this information is available on the CMS website and will be available on the Home Care Alliance website as well. So if you can see here for Massachusetts, the reimbursement rates for days 1 through 60, overall it's a minus 0.27% decrease, but the range ranges from a positive 1.51% in Quincy County to negative 2.57% in Barnstable. For, for days 61 plus, it's overall negative 0.38. However, the range is 1.39% positive in Quincy County to negative 2.69% in Barnstable. And the cap rate is going to be set at 28,000 $689.04, effective 10 one to 9-30-2018. Uh, this next slide is probably a little bit difficult for you to see, which is why we will um, put this on the website and it is available on CMS, but I wanted you to be able to see what the proposed wage index changes are for the state of Massachusetts. In the 2018 proposed rule, CMS addresses the service intensity add-on budget neutrality factor. As part of the hospice payment reform implementation of the SIA, 
CMS stated that they would monitor SIA utilization and apply an adjustment to the two-tier rate to comply with budget neutrality requirements. The offsets are marginal, as noted, and this indicates to CMS that there has been no significant practice change with the implementation of the SIA. Medicare spending outside the hospice benefit is a continued concern for CMS. In the proposed rule, CMS notes that spending for Medicare Parts A and B have consistently declined. There has been a, an overall 25% reduction in spending um, between fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2016. Medicare Part D has increased, however. We can see that it has increased from uh, $331 million in fiscal year 2012 to $347.5 million in fiscal year 2016. And we will be watching this very closely as there's likely to be further action by CMS related to Medicare Part D spending. So providers will need to monitor Medicare Part D spending closely to ensure appropriate utilization of the Medicare hospice benefit. Of particular concern noted by CMS are the drugs related to common palliative and other disease-specific conditions and also the use of maintenance drugs. One of the most troubling areas noted in the 2018 proposed rule includes the solicitation of comments by CMS related to uh, data for certifying terminal illness. In the proposed rule, CMS questions the source of clinical information for the hospice medical director to use, not sue, in making certification decisions and questions about LCD indicators and whether long-term monitoring and evaluation by a physician separate from the hospice medical director is necessary. CMS is soliciting comments on some options related to specifying that the referring MD and or post-acute or acute care facilities medical record would serve as the basis for the initial hospice eligibility determination that the individual uh, patient would be certified prior to hospice admission, and that documentation of the visit from a hospice medical director or physician to support, um, to support the, the certification eligibility would really be only supportive. It would not be used as a mandate for initial certification. This is an extremely important area that uh, we're actually going to have more detail in an upcoming update. Um, so please stay tuned because we will be looking for comments here, both on uh, response to CMS's proposal, but also CMS is requesting recommendations on basically best practices and what providers would like to see that would meet, uh, address their concern about ensuring that the clinical information uh, that is used for hospice eligibility determination and certification is accurate and that the, the medical director and the hospice are in, uh, involved in that decision making. In the 2018 proposed rule, CMS also includes hospice industry data. Over the next few slides, I will share some national data and, where available, some Massachusetts data as well. This slide lists the national percentage of hospice days by level of care. And you can see that routine home care remains, by and large, the, the largest uh, setting in, or level of care that hospice care is provided. Additional data includes the following. And again, note that this is 2015 claims data. The average lifetime length of stay is 113.5 days of routine home care. That means of total hospice, uh, hospice certification periods, even if a patient has been admitted or discharged and discharged from hospice and readmitted, their total lifetime days of routine home care average 113.5 days. The median total live discharge rate remains again around 17% nationally, and this includes 38% beneficiary revocations, 51% where the beneficiary is no longer terminally ill, or determined to be no longer terminally ill, and also 11% uh, tra beneficiary transfer to another hospice. CMS is going to continue to monitor this. They do state in the, in the proposed rule that the analysis does not reveal any anomalies in length of stay and rates of live discharge at this time. But as we know, as I said, MedPAC and CMS will continue to monitor this. 
This is also national data, and we will work with the NAC and the, or NGS and CMS to see if we can get the Massachusetts-specific data for providers. This is showing that skilled visits prior to death of, of these, the patients served, 43.6% of patients did not receive a skilled visit, RN or social worker, in the last seven days of life. 21% of patients did not receive a skilled visit on the last day, on the day of death, and relatively the same amount of nursing and social work services, 1.6 hours a day, occurred between fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16. What this is interesting, given that the SIA, again, has been in effect uh, since January 2016. So we note that CMS is indicating here, and this is here, that they are concerned, they're concerned about services not being provided. And according to this 2016 claims data, it really hasn't impacted the, uh, the implementation of the SIA has not really impacted service utilization. But again, it's a catch-22. On the one hand, we are being monitored to ensure that we are not overutilizing services due to the incentives of the payment. But the other side is really looking at whether or not services are not being provided that could be or should be provided in those last days of life. So it really is a balancing act that providers need to be monitoring very, very closely to ensure appropriate service utilization and appropriate care. Back to 2015 claims data, this includes not only some national data, but Massachusetts data as well. We can see with Medicare hospice deaths versus total Medicare deaths, nationally the percentage is 46.6%, and for Massachusetts it's 43.3%. For Medicare hospice admissions, nationally we have just over 1.3 million, almost 1.4 million, and in Massachusetts there are 27,663. Medicare total days of hospice care, nationally, 94, uh, points, uh, 94 million, uh, just over 94 million, almost 95 million. And then in Massachusetts, we have 1.7 million plus days of hospice care. Looking at the mean days of hospice care, again, looking at 2015 claims data, which is slightly different um, than, than the data is, um, cited in MedPAC. But it shows that nationally we have 69 days, and in Massachusetts our average is 62 days. Again, this is based on calendar year um, claims data. And median days of hospice care nationally is about 23 days, and same for Massachusetts. So you can see that the mean and median days of hospice care based on this data are pretty consistent with national data. Uh, however, we we, in practice, we know that our length of stay is still considered very short, with some providers much shorter than others. So this data is useful to you as you plan for your own growth and changes in hospice operations while working to be as efficient as possible while maintaining quality care. Shifting gears, we're now going to briefly discuss some key compliance and auditing areas facing hospice providers in 2017. We're, uh, hospices are, need to continue to in, incorporate into their compliance programs uh, the, the efforts, the program integrity efforts that need to be monitored. And the way to do that is through the PEPR reports, which we're going to talk about in a moment, as well as monitoring medical review through the MAX, ZPEX, or RAC activity, as well as the Office of Inspector General Work Plan. So here are the PEPR target areas as of March of 2017. Note that there are new PEPR reports available as of April 2017 that include this data. It's important that your agency downloads this information and monitors the findings. As CMS and the Department of Justice also monitor these reports for aberrant behavior. Note the new items that are color-coded, uh, which include the live discharge, um, the revocations, as well as live discharge with length of stay at 61 to 179 days, which of course has been implemented uh, once we began the two-tiered rate. The claims of single diagnosis coded, which is continuing to be monitored. Again, not just looking at high or uh, utilization of GIP or continuous home care or appropriate use of those levels of care, but also if there is no GIP or continuous home care provided, as well as long-term inpatient care stays. Again, it's a catch-22. So it's, it's an 
really it's a matter of ensuring that for every single visit and every day of hospice care that the patient is in a uh, uh, in in uh, a GIP or continuous home care level of care that you can document very clearly the uh, the eligibility for the patient to be receiving care at that at that level. So the OIG work plan for 2017 lists two new focus areas for hospice, although they're really a culmination of previous focus areas. An area of concern continue to be eligibility, GIP utilization, and hospice SNF and hospice ALF care. Looking through the CMS crystal ball, it's possible that in the future we will see a focus on Medicare expenditures outside of the hospice benefit, live discharges, and possibly a closer monitoring of the length of stay with the two-tier rate. I'm going to shift again to and talk now about survey deficiencies. Survey activity has been monitored in Massachusetts with a total of 56 deficiencies in fiscal year of 2016. This, there were 53 standard deficiencies statewide as well as uh, three uh, condition level deficiencies. There were no complaint, uh, there were complaint surveys, but none that resulted in standard or uh, condition level deficiencies. This data comes from the CMS Survey and CERT database for fiscal year um, ending 2016. We're now going to talk about the top survey deficiencies identified by CMS as, as of 2000, as of, well, this is really at the end of 2016. These are the most common LTAGs to identify problems resulting in plans of correction for hospice providers. Most of these LTAGs have been in the top five or top ten for a few years. It's important to note, however, that hospices are required to meet all conditions of participation in LTAGs. Therefore, hospices must be familiar with the state operations manual as well as state licensure requirements uh, So, in order to ensure full compliance. So the top five for calendar year 16, again, this is nationally, includes the plan of care. As you can see, two of, two of, the, of the, the tags relate to the plan of care, supervision of hospice aids, as well as nursing services and the drug profile. For Massachusetts, based on, on the data provided again from Survey and Search, these are the common tags uh, for Region 1. So I'm sorry, not just Massachusetts, this is Region 1. Uh, so it's L591, which is nursing service, as well as compliance with federal, state, local laws and regs, as well as the approach to service delivery, and again, two tags related to the comprehensive assessment and the provision of core services. We will work to provide you with Massachusetts-specific results in the near future. Some of the operational issues as, um, that, that we, we hear in, that are facing Massachusetts hospice providers as we wrap up this overview section will include the following. Contracting issues, especially with pharmacy and infusion, as well as obtaining hospital contracts for general inpatient level of care. Medication issues, especially with the skilled nursing facilities and narcotics, as well as staffing and recruitment and retention is a, is a common area, I think, across most providers, if not all, as well as the knee. And so we're going to continue to monitor these areas. As a hospice, at hospice provider request, the Alliance will be holding uh, quarterly networking meetings to share operational and regulatory concerns and identify opportunities that the Alliance can offer to assist in these areas. Some of these areas we're currently working on to include, um, to, to assist providers include continued work with identification and development of palliative care programs and hospice and skilled nursing facility training and collaboration. Please feel free to share any other suggestions with our team. We're now going to briefly discuss the hospice quality reporting program, current requirements, updates, and the 2018 proposed rule information. This is a key area for hospices. It's important for hospice leaders to communicate with staff and managers the importance of quality on hospice provision and, of course, the potential for financial impact uh, on qual uh, related to quality, most of which are intangible at this point in time but have a definite impact on the hospice's bottom line. Certainly, participate in the hospice quality reporting requirements. If you don't participate, you, that is a direct impact because of the 2% reduction in the market basket. 
Uh, hospice item set accuracy is right now not tied to payment, but it will be, it is tied to public reporting. And ultimately in the future, especially with the further development of a comprehensive assessment called the HEART tool, once that's implemented, ultimately this may be a, a tool that is used similar to home health where some reimbursement may also be, uh, be, be calculated based on those results. So accuracy here is significantly important, as well as CAP surveys. Again, right now, there isn't a direct financial impact as long as you're participating, but certainly with, uh, with public reporting and, and then in the future, potentially value-based purchasing, it certainly is an area that, that requires continued monitoring and training to ensure that, that staff are able to meet the, the needs that are identified in the CAP survey and be able to communicate effectively with the patients and the family members. Obviously, the impact of outcomes on referral relationships, that's a here and now. So in other words, we know that as, as our data begins to be reported publicly, we will be compared, as we are in home health, to, uh, to other providers, and that this may have an impact on referral relationships, which is why it is extremely important. And of course, internal operations and cost efficiencies, streamlining operations, and monitoring and managing productivity, even for hospice, uh, because we want to make sure that, in fact, we are as efficient as possible while maintaining quality. Some of the key areas to implement in preparation for these initiatives and establishing a quality and data-driven agency include the following. You want to make sure you have efficient operations and an understanding of your agency's financial status. Establish those key performance indicators and metrics and ensure that you have a very strong quality program and commitment to continuous improvement of quality measures. Just a brief overview of the hospice quality reporting requirements as they are currently. As of January 1st, 2017, we have to meet an 80% submission threshold for the HIS admission and discharge assessment within 30 days. As of January 1st, 2018, that threshold will increase to 90%, which is CMS's goal. So it's extremely important that you download and print your validation reports and address all errors, all fatal errors, to make sure that, in fact, every, uh, that the assessments are resubmitted within the 30 days. CMS has provided expanded functionality of the CASPER reports to assist with this monitoring since December of 2016. So it is really important as an organization that you know who, is, who are the two people within your organization who have access to the key system and the CASPER reports and that you have an understanding of, of what your, your submission rates are and that you have a process for correcting any identified issues in a timely manner. For the CAPS hospice survey, it's been in effect since April 1st of 2015. And then as of 2017, and it's going to continue into 2018, any new hospices are exempt uh, for the, that first year uh, from, from participating in the CAPS requirements. In the 2017 final rule, which we're living now, the, the new quality measures were finalized uh, effective April 1st of 2017. So as of April 1st of this year, you, you should be collecting this data. Hospice visits when death is imminent, it's a measure pair, which we'll discuss in a moment, as well as the hospice and palliative care composite measure, which assesses the percentage of hospice patients who received care processes consistent with existing guidelines. So for the measure pair, there are two components. One is the, the first measure is assessing the percentage of patients receiving at least one visit from registered nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, or PAs in the last three days of life. The second measure assesses the percentage of patients receiving at least two visits from medical social workers, chaplains, or spiritual counselors, licensed practical nurses, or hospice aides in the last seven days of life. The data for the paired measure is collected via the, the hospice item set. And again, CMS has started collecting this data with the hospice version 2.0, uh, excuse me, the HIS version 2.0, effective uh, April 1st of 2017. <clears throat> so 
the second measure, which also has been effective at, since April 1, 2017, includes the, the hospice and palliative care composite measure, comprehensive assessment at admission. It includes the seven measures that are currently being reported on the HIST and calculates the percentage of patients for whom the HIST admission records contain data on all seven of these measures. And the individual components of the measure are still addressed separately and then aggregated into one score. So for 2018, under the proposed rule for hospice quality reporting, there's no, there are no new measures and there's no elimination of the current measures. However, there are two claims-based measures under consideration and development. They include potentially avoidable hospice care transitions, which will closely relate to uh, hospice care and transfers to other settings, including hospital readmissions, as well as access to level of hospice care, again, with a focus on continuous home care and general inpatient uh, level of care. And CMS is seeking comments on these new measures, and this is another area that we will be providing further information and seeking your comments and feedback. Also in the 2018 proposed rule, uh, the uh, CMS proposes at the continuation of the proposal for an enhanced data collection instrument, and this instrument now has a name, and it is called the HEART tool, Hospice Evaluation and Reporting Tool. It is still in the early stages of development. It's going to be a modification of the HIST to be more in line with other post-acute care settings, such as OASIS and MDS. And the two primary objectives are to provide the quality data necessary for hospice quality reporting requirements and the current functioning of the, the hospice item set and all as well as to provide additional clinical data that could inform future payment refinements. And there's no time frame yet for implementation of this, of this tool. For public reporting and the hospice compare site, CMS is developing the hospice compare site. Uh, the public reporting will include ultimately both the seven quality measures currently collected through HIS and the results of the hospice cap survey. However, they're initially going, CMS will initially publish only the seven current HIS measures individually. The cap survey measures will be added in winter of 2017 and the new measures, those measures that I just presented that, that have, that data collection has begun April 1st of 2017, the time frame for, for reporting of those measures is to be determined. Hospice Compare is scheduled to be operational sometime in late summer of, of, two, of uh, sorry, of uh, calendar year 2017. So we can expect somewhere toward the end of the summer that we will begin to see public reporting of those seven HIS measures. The measures will be reported if the hospice has a minimum denominator size of 20 clients based on 12 rolling months of data. Hospices will be able to preview and challenge the results each quarter prior to public reporting. The first report in preparation for this first round of public reporting in late summer of 2017, the preview process preview report will be downloaded from CMS through the keys and CASPA reporting system to providers on June 1st of 2017. Hospices have 30 days to review and, and appeal the, any findings that they that they have or concerns they have regarding the, the findings or the, the data. And then for further information regarding this, there's a lot of detail. You go to the CMS Hospice Quality Reporting website and you can receive the training materials as well as further guidance and also ask questions. For star ratings, star ratings for hospice, there is no date yet. It's not set uh, any time. Um, within the near future, it's not a question of if, but when. We will have star ratings at some point in, in hospice. And another final area for the 2018 proposed rule, CMS is seeking ideas and suggestions for reducing regulatory burden, and that relates to payment system redesign, elimination or streamlining of reporting, and documentation requirements. And this is another area where, again, any comments that you have, um, please submit them to the Home Care Alliance. Uh, and also, providers are encouraged also to submit uh, comments to CMS directly as well, in addition to providing comments to the State Association. So some of the strategies for leaders in 2018, preparing for public reporting, really getting ready uh, for the data that you're going to see 
what the response is going to be, and how you will be incorporating those results into your quality assessment and performance improvement programs, daily operations, as well as how you're going to utilize the information from a, uh, a, a, a marketing and referral management standpoint. Continuing to streamline operations for cost-effective service delivery, continue uh, uh, recruitment and retention of qualified staff, and looking and focusing on how to, how to re retain the staff uh, and be able to support them through mentoring programs, preceptor programs, supporting services and programs and operational initiatives that may be able to keep, keep employ valued employees and, but, and keeping them productive as well as uh, retaining them within the organization. Certainly also monitoring the compliance areas that we've discussed already today. Survey readiness is always an ongoing uh, priority, especially since we know with the IMPACT Act, we are now going to be surveyed, you know, at least every, we're surveyed every three years anyway. So we want to make sure that, in fact, we are ready and we're in compliance with the COPs and state regulations and accreditation standards if you're accredited. You want to consider your role in post-acute services and palliative care and positioning and collaboration among other providers and systems. Ultimately, as a, as a healthcare industry, hospice will be, need to be part of, of a larger continuum of care and collaboration is going to be key um, for the industry as well as for agency uh, survival and operations. With that, I'm going to I finish the formal part of the presentation. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, and as you can see, I've left both, I have both of my email addresses here, and you certainly can reach Pat and Colleen and Megan as well for further questions. Megan? Thank you, Kim. Um, so again, at this time, we, we left everyone on mute just for the sake of background um, distractions. So if you have any questions, in your sidebar, um, there is a questions tab and a chat tab that you can write in that we can um, address now. Um, this was recorded, so if you need to go back and listen to something, um, then it will be made available after it's processed. Um, and then I'll also resend out the slides. I know Kim made a few changes from the ones that you originally got, so you'll get the updated ones um, later today as well. So again, if you have any questions, now is the time that we can um, answer those for you. Okay, and uh, Kim, do you have anything else you want to add before we end today? No, just thank you everybody for participating in today's webinar, and I hope that you find the information useful. The Home Care Alliance will continue to provide you with up weekly updates as well as updates to this information and uh, other initiatives that uh, we um, that we that we find and here are valuable for the members. So your feedback is greatly appreciated and encouraged. And thank you again. Great. Thank you very much, Kim. And thank you all for calling in today. I hope you have a great rest of your day and week. Bye. Thank you.